I'm going to wait just a couple minutes and see if we get a couple more people showing up. Okay, well, I think we can go ahead and get started. Does anyone have any questions before we start up? Okay, I will take that as a no. And let's see. I was just thinking about something that I needed to talk about or wanted to talk about, and I completely blanked on it. Um, hopefully, it will pop back in my head shortly. Uh, I think it was something to do with one of the topics today, but. Um, what I'm going to be doing today is we're going to talk about uh, functional programming a bit, and then we're going to talk about builders and domain-specific languages. So let's, oh, I almost it almost popped back in my head again. Oh, I know what it was. Let's see. 
I don't know that I have talked about uh, creating files for different classes and things like that. And I, I just want to you know go over that really quickly. Hopefully, it's it's actually come up in some examples along the way. Uh, most of the examples that I've done in the class have been in these weak files that I've had, where I've just been treating a file as a collection of functions and classes. Um, but you can also create classes in their own files. So we could do something like new Kotlin file class. I'll call it a class here. So I'll just use the word class. And maybe I say person. And what that's going to do is it creates a, a file called person.kt. Now it's going to show up over on the side here with just the class name. Now that's going to be uh, one of the public classes listed in here. I think it's going to take it as the first one. So if I had class um, address in here as well, um, what you're going to see if there's multiple classes, you're just going to see the file name listed as person.kt, and that contains multiple classes. If there's only a single class, it'll actually just show you that class name. Um, I believe. Yeah, that's the way it does. So if there's multiple classes, it'll just be based on the file name, which was the name of the class that we first created. Uh, on the file system, the way this is always laid out is the package name is the qualifier in front of the class name. So if you take the package name and replace any dots in it with slashes, that gives you a file path. For example, if I came in here and said new package, if I called my package a.b.c, Note that it's creating this structure here, A, B, C. That actually is a directory structure on the disk. And that represents where this, this uh, file is going to be located when I create one. So if I come in here and say, create a person here, this is package A.B.C, class name is person. If we look on, let's find this real quick here. Uh, we can. Why is that not showing up? Scott, idea projects. Huh. I'm looking at my file system. I'm not seeing week 10 showing up under my idea projects folder. Oh, because I actually, I didn't create it under users, Scott. I created under C colon Scott idea projects. Wonderful, good job, Scott. Uh, let me fix that real quick. I'm gonna close this project. And I'm going to take that week 10 that I created and move it under users Scott idea project so I don't lose where I put it again. And then let's see if I can open that up. And I'm having some fun issues because of a network drive that I do not have connected. One little note, if you um, have any network drives defined on Windows and they're not currently accessible, sometimes this open file project dialog will hang. And that is a real bummer. Um, so let's see here. There's week 10 there. And we'll open him up there. So now that's in the right place. Let me go into that week 10 directory. And we can see under here, underneath source main Kotlin, I now have a directory called A, that's that first path, who has a subclass, subdirectory called B, subdirectory called C, <clears throat> and then person.kt. Now, if I also had in that project, source main Kotlin, let's create another package here. Let's say I created a package underneath B. So I'll call it A, B, and then X. So now you notice how it's it's showing you the X directory in there. And we'll make a person in there as well. Each of these are distinct classes fully qualified by their package name. So that way they can be distinct. And when you're using them, you just choose which one you want to import. So if I came in here, I could say import a.b.c.person. And that's explicitly telling me which person I'm interested in. So if I come in here and say val person equals person, notice that it gives ABC as a choice and ABX as a choice. Um, so this one now I'm actually bringing in person ABC. 
the import statements here mean whenever I mention the name person, I mean a.b.c.person. So this person down here is explicitly a.b.c.person. Now I could, but I strongly do not recommend it, do this, a.b.c.splat. And what that means is that if I see a name I don't recognize, take a look and see if it exists under ABC. And you could have multiple of these star imports. Um, these star imports are a really, really horrible idea. Um, let me show you why. So let's say that we started off with, um, let me create another package in here. So we'll say a.b.d. And right now, a.b.d, let's say that he had a class in there called foo. And let's say in this guy here, I wanted to use foo and I wanted to use person. So I do something like this. And this is the first version of my program and it works brilliantly. Um, but let's say that later on, I added a person class to a.b.d. Um, or even worse, let's say that both of these packages are in a third party library that I'm pulling in. So it's not even my code, I have no control. And somebody adds a person to ABD. So you know, maybe one developer is, has created this package for their third party library, another developer created this one. So if I pretend that I'm that other developer and I go in here and I say, I'm creating a new person class. And we go back to this week one, notice what happens with person here. So it tells us here that it's unresolved because there are multiple choices. Uh, it exists in multiple places here. Uh, this is why the star is really a bad idea because what happens if somebody adds something to a package, it can actually blow up your code that was compiling perfectly cleanly. So instead of doing this, we really wanna use explicit imports so that we know where person is coming from and we know where who is coming from. But every once in a while, you're gonna to need to use a class with the same name in multiple places. And in Java, the only way to do this is to explicitly fully qualify things. So if I came in here and said val person two equals a.b.d.person, that'll work just fine. I've explicitly qualified this name, so I'm telling it which one it is. Um, but this gets really gross to use that every single place you wanna use it. Fortunately in Kotlin, they added in a little as clause, so you can give it an alias. And this alias is really nice because now I can just say person two, and I don't have to worry about fully qualifying it everywhere. I can actually make it unique based on names within this file. Now this is only, these imports are only gonna affect this file. They won't affect anything else, uh, but they give you a mapping of how I'm pulling in things from other packages. Uh, so that can be very, very useful. Um, but the main thing I wanted to talk about here was that you can create separate files for separate classes or separate groups of classes if you want to. Okay, any questions on that? Okay, so um, that's how you import things. Please, please, please do not use that star import. That star import, it, it caused a ton of trouble on Java when we went from Java 1 to Java 1.1. Uh, way back in, um, I guess it was the either late, late 90s, pretty sure it was in the late 90s, it might have been 2000. Um, initially in Java, they had a Java util package that had um, things like uh, a, a um, hash map and a vector, which was a list of things. And then they also had a Java AWT package, which was their GUI package. And so you might have a list in the GUI package, which was a list of stuff on the screen you could scroll through. Um, but at that point, they didn't have a list underneath Java util. So people often had import java.awt.star and import java.util.star. And, and during Java 1, that was perfectly fine. But as soon as Java 1.2 came along, uh, they added the list class to java.util. And so everybody who had these and referenced list in their code, which there was a lot of people who did that, their code blew up 
And that was especially problematic if they had written code that was over a year old sitting in a repository. Somebody has to come in and fix a bug, they check it out and it doesn't build. And they're wondering why did people check in code that doesn't build? Um, it, it, it was really an annoying issue. So the, the solution to this is really just be explicit on these imports. And when you're typing, the, you don't actually have to type these, you know, when you're actually doing your, um, let's see, what's, uh, let me create another class in here. So let's say that I had a new class in here called Funky. And if I want to use Funky, I can come down here and just choose it, and that'll automatically add the import up there. Now, most of the time we haven't seen those yet because this import section is normally automatically collapsed. So you won't actually see those things in there. Um, and you usually don't need to even see these. Um, if you have a printed out file, yeah, it's kind of useful because that acts as your index to show you what everything is. But while you're coding, if you want to know what something really is, you can just float over it and it'll tell you the actual type of it. Note the a.b.c in there. Uh, so you know, that actually gives you the real type of it. It's in package ABC, class is person, and it's in defined in the person.kt file. Okay, any questions on any of that? Okay, so good, good. I, I'm glad I remembered to do that because it's something that uh, I think I forgot at, at various points to talk about. And uh, you, know, you don't want to have all your code in one file, obviously. Uh, you're going to break it down into usually one file per one class per file. Um, but if you have related things or if you have like a sealed class with a sealed class, you have to define all the subtypes in the same file as well. Um, so whatever feels comfortable as far as the breakdown, you can put a separate, you know, separate classes in separate files. Sometimes it makes sense or feels more comfortable to have them be inside a single file. Okay, so let's take a look at So this one I created, that was my week one one. I guess I'll go into week two, week 1002. Let's create a little main here. And let's talk a little bit about functional programming. And um, what's really interesting is that a lot of the functional things that are uh, a, a lot of uh, things that make programming functional programming, we've already been doing. And I have one too many M's in there. Uh, the big thing that we really want to concentrate on is immutability. Makes functions much simpler to understand. Um, if you're passing in data that's immutable, or if you're returning data that's immutable, obviously it can't change. So you can't have side effects happen inside of a function that suddenly change behavior to an object outside of it. If you're passing in an immutable object, anybody who happened to be looking at it outside of that function call isn't gonna be affected because the object data can't change it. If we had something like class person and we had name is a variable inside of it, we can start by saying val person Scott, something like that. And then let's say we have a function that's going to do something. Say, so let's say we change the name to Scooter or something like that. Um, inside this function, we're actually passing it some data that's immutable. Um, person, this variable here, is definitely immutable. He's a pointer to a person object. So that means inside this function, we can't say person equals a new person. All parameters coming in are immutable. Note that that's the person pointer. It's pointing to this person. So out in the main, we, we created a person on the heap. We pointed this person variable to it. And then we're going to call change name on that person, passing in that pointer. We're not actually passing in the person object. But we can follow that pointer to the object that it's pointing at. 
And unfortunately, that object is not immutable. He has data inside of him that can change. That's what our var means here. Strings by themselves are not mutable. So if I had said val there, first of all, I can't change person.name because I can't make that name point to a different string. But if I said person.name dot, let's say that it had a set character. That would mean that the, the name, the string itself is immutable. We'd be following the person to the, to the person object, looking at the name pointer, following it to the string that it's defined at, and then trying to change the value of that string. Well, fortunately, strings themselves are immutable. Once you set them, you can't change them. If we had this as a var, we can change where that name points to and point it to a different string. And that's what we were doing down here when I said equals scooter. So by doing this, we're creating a new string called scooter that's going to be sitting on the heap. Um, now, that's I, there's a little bit of a misnomer there. Um, depending on how you define strings, like you define as a string literal here, this string literal may actually end up being stored inside the class file that's generated. Um, that's the binary that's going to be executed. And so what will happen is these are kept track of in what they call a string pool. And the string pool will reuse strings that have the same names under some circumstances. Now I'm being a little wishy-washy here because depending on the circumstances, something like this, those are going to be two actual different string objects. So if I looked at if I looked at where scooter is defined and I look at where the string SCO concatenated with the string OTR, which creates a brand new string of Scooter, they're actually going to be objects at different ad different addresses. But if I looked at uh, the equality between those two, so if I have these two strings, let me just do this. S1 and S2, and if I checked if S1 equal equal S2, that's going to return true because they have the same value, the same semantic meaning behind them. Um, so strings are a little bit weird that way, but generally you want to consider strings are immutable. That's the most important thing. You can't do anything with that string once you've followed S1 or followed S2 to those strings. So in this particular case, we're creating a brand new string with Scooter. We're going to change where name is pointing to point to them. So we've actually modified that person object. The problem you get there is that now, if we call change name multiple times, uh, let's say, let's do something like this. Let's say var n equals zero. And we do something like this, which is kind of silly. But what I'm going to do is every time this is called, we're going to update the name to scooter with a different number on the end of it. The problem we get here is that every time we call change name with the same argument person, we're getting different values. And the reason for this is that this function has side effects. It's actually changing a piece of data that was passed into it, as well as changing this global variable. Um, you don't want to do that as much as possible. The more you can have functions strictly work on immutable data and not have side effects, the easier your program is going to be to understand, the easier your program is going to be to make sure it does the right thing. Um, and it's going to make it so much easier to test it. Um, if we tried writing a test for this one, we're going to have to make sure that we're setting some data on the outside, like this guy here, that he has access to, and make sure that we reset that before each test run. Otherwise, you get different results in each test run, and that's not going to be good. So what we've got in here, um, at this point, um, data has changed as a side effect. So we really want to avoid that. We want to try to make things immutable, makes functions simpler to understand and test. We can do that by writing pure functions. And a pure function, if you have same input, always get same output. That's the first, the first rule of a pure function. 
And second, no side effects. So no data is changed outside of that function. It's a complete black box. It doesn't touch anything outside of that black box. He may have some variables through the life of that function. So maybe something at the top of this. Maybe there's some a variable defined inside the function. That's perfectly fine. And you can update that variable through the life of the function. But any of these local variables like this n here will go away when that function call is done. So it doesn't affect anything on the outside of the program. Pure functions become much simpler to test. I'm sorry. Good evening, it's Brooke. I wanted to let you know my PC is having issues. I had to sign on another PC my brother uses. Can't figure out how to sign on to my name though. Okay, yeah, no problem at all. Um, so you are, uh, I'm guessing Bradley. Yeah, there we go, from Bradley, Washington. Okay, excellent. Oh, and I was not supposed to read that aloud. I'm sorry, uh, I'm jumping over there. I Hopefully that wasn't anything sensitive. Um, but uh, yeah, so I'm sorry. So you had some had some issues, but you're in there now. I know who you are, and I'm not going to say, wait a minute, we've got a stranger in the room. Uh, Protocol five, kick them out. Um, so uh, yeah, um, that should be fine. Uh, no worries there. Um, anyway, so with this local variable, local variables will go away at the end of of um, uh, at the end of the function call. So we're not changing any data outside. Um, any questions on that? So let's take a look. You know, this change name function obviously can't work. What would we need to do to make this work? Well, if we want to make this a pure function, I'm going to call this, rename this to be change name x. If we really want this to be a pure function, then the same data coming in, a person, is always going to produce the same data coming out. What we're going to do is have this change name create a brand new person for us, which has the new data, and make the person immutable. So I'm going to rename this guy to be person X. And he's going to have a val for a name. So he's now going to be a uh, immutable person. So I'm going to create him. He's going to be immutable. Note that here, that's now a problem. That will not work. There's no way for us to, uh, to change the name of the existing person. We have to create a brand new person. So I'm just gonna comment this guy out. And let's comment on our person X up here because we're not gonna use him anymore. And then down here, what we're gonna do is change the name to whatever we want to change the name to. Let's say Scooter. And we're going to say return person Scooter. Just like that. And he needs to actually be declared to actually return a person like that. So person is an immutable pointer to an immutable one of these days I'm gonna to learn to type. I'll just uppercase this. So in this case, person is an immutable pointer to an immutable person object. So even if I follow that person to the object, I still can't change data inside there. Okay. So this particular function is gonna change the name. Now what we've done, this function is pure because we're not having any side effects. We're only acting on immutable data and the same input will always produce the same output. Um, so if I take this change name function and run it a hundred times, it's not going to change this person that came in, but I can say new person equals change name, blah, 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 blah. Now at some level in your program, you're going to need to actually use data and modify data and store data. The goal is to try to isolate that as much as possible. The more you can make the lower level functions be pure, the easier time you're gonna have testing those. And then higher level functions that call those may actually end up working with data that they change. So example up here, we may say bar person. So now we have mutable data. And then just at each step here, say person equals that to update it. Now, if we have like a list, for example, we might have var list equals 
list of. Note that this is a immutable list that I'm creating here. And we'll say A. Maybe we're going to say list equals list plus B. So we're going to add an element to the list. Maybe we're going to add a C to it. Note that each of these times we're creating a brand new list. This assignment operator, if we take a look at him by control clicking on him, is going to create a brand new array list, add all the elements of the previous list, add the new list, and return the result. So we're safe on this in that if anybody else happened to have been looking at the list before we did this step, they're not going to be affected because they're still looking at an immutable object. We're creating a brand new object here and then just changing the pointer that we're referencing. If we had passed this off to some other function, foo, and maybe he kicks off a thread to actually work on that list, he would still be looking at that initial list that only had the A in it. And then if we called him here, he would only be looking at the one that has the A and the B. He wouldn't be seeing that C. And so there's no possible conflicts. What this does for us is allow, let's say, automated parallelization where possible. And one of the things that, that has happened with uh, computers and speed is we used to have Moore's Law applying, which wasn't really a law, but it was a pretty accurate observation of the world where every 18 months we were doubling the speed of computers. And that was true up until um, I think 10-ish years ago, maybe 15 years ago. Um, it's kind of neat to see things like that die during my lifetime where it's like, you know, something holds really well and then suddenly, ah, they can't keep up. And the problem was it was just harder and harder to make things as small as they've made them and actually increase the speed of them. So what they rely on a lot more now is having multiple processors. So instead of just having one or two processors on your chip, you might have eight or 10, sometimes even more. There's some that there's, you'll have like 64 of them. And these allow you to do work on separate processors at the same time, much, making your program much, much faster. However, you need to make sure that your thread's safe at that point. If all of your functions are uh, pure, they can't possibly affect data that some other function is using or that some other thread is using. So if, the, if things are running parallel, it doesn't matter. So what you can do is you can build up parallelization in your program. Parallelization, <laughs> wow, par 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 parallelization. That's a little trickier to, to come off my tongue than I thought it was. You can build that up by breaking your program down, kicking things off onto multiple threads, gathering the results, and then combining them. And that way you can take advantage of a lot higher speed processing. It's kind of neat stuff. Um, let's see, what else did I want to talk about here before I move on to that next piece? Um, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. Um, function chaining. And this is more of a style issue. Um, with functional programming, uh, typically the, the style that people like is the dot notation into a long chain. So if I had this list here and I wanted to run it through several steps to do things, um, like let's say I'm gonna add a couple more things here. Maybe I'm gonna say list one dot filter it dot uh, uh, let's see, what is it? It's a list of, should be length, right? Unresolved reference list. Oh, just list. Duh. There we go. Uh, length equals one. So maybe I want to just filter it down to start with to things that only have one element in them. And then maybe I want to map it into dollar it with X's on either side for whatever reason. Um, whoops. 
Note that in this case, I had to put the dollar it in curly braces because of the X after it. If I didn't have that curly brace, it would look like dollar it X, which doesn't exist. Um, and then maybe I wanted to do some logic on it. In this case, I'll just print the values. This is functional chaining. And the whole idea of functional chaining, this is a more of a declarative style. So you're describing what you're trying to do. Um, and in this case, if you look through it, it really is describing fairly concisely the actions that you're performing against this list. In this, in this case, to create a new list. So in this case, we're going to drop down to just those three elements, A, B, and C, with X's on either side of each of the elements. Um, well, actually, the for each, that's not going to work, because this for each is a unit, I believe. Yeah, he's a unit. So this would actually, new list would be of type unit, which would be bad. Um, so this is actually performing an action against things. If I wanted to create a brand new list, I could say, val new list equals whatever pieces we want there. And we could, of course, say new list dot for each and do something with it there as well. But typically in a chain style, you won't break things up like this unless you still needed to access that list after the for each. So at this point, when I say list dot 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 for each, I can no longer access that list. It's now gone. It was a local variable that was created. It keeps track of it going through each of these steps, and then it goes away at the end of this walk. Okay, any questions on that? So that's that's a chained functional style. Um, and I strongly recommend that when you're using a language that supports functional uh, uh, programming, like you know Java, uh, Java now does, where you have streams, it's done since Java 8. Um, when you're doing Java streams, you'll have code that looks very similar to this, <clears throat> but with Java syntax, obviously. Um, and then, you know, obviously Kotlin does functional. I strongly recommend that if you have functional support, you um, use this chain style. Um, it is possible and it's completely legal to do something like this. And then val x, actually, then just um, x2 for each. That's completely legal to do something like this. But notice how you have to put a lot more thought into following the pattern here. You have to, at this point, you have to say, well, what was x1? It's up here. Well, what was x2? It's up here. You have to do that mapping. And it may seem like you look at it and you're like, oh, yeah, that just happens. I, I map that automatically. But it actually is an extra step for your head to go through. Up here, you're saying list, filter it, map it for each it. You're just kind of walking straight through that chain of things there. Um, now, we also could do things like val list two equals mutable list of, and then have inside of here a, b, c. Oh, come on. And then do things like for i in. Uh, list two dot indices, which will give you zero through two. And then say list two sub i equals list two sub i x dollar that. And this is an imperative style. Imperative style describes steps and describes uh, steps or actions you're taking. So you're describing how to do something. Functional style describes, oh, come on. Um, 
what to do. This describes how to do something. Um, I'm going to say explicit steps, actions, because you, you really are still doing uh, steps here. But it, with functional style, you're describing what you want to do, not how to do it. The how you do it is actually defined inside the functions that you're calling. Does that make some sense? Any questions on that? So it's a stylistic thing. And I, I strongly recommend if you're using a functional language or a language that supports functional programming that you embrace this. Because uh, you're going to see it a lot, you know. When you're, if you're programming in Kotlin, you're going to see a lot of Kotlin code that looks like this. And if you're programming in Haskell or Scala or something like that, you're going to see a lot of it. And uh, in newer Java programs, you're going to start to see more and more of it. Um, yeah, you know, the stream stuff people are starting to embrace more. Uh, but with Kotlin, it was something that they had baked into language from the from the start. Okay. Any questions? Okay, now, is it more memory efficient to do functional? Um, usually the opposite, fortunately. Now, it depends on what you're doing because um, each of these steps, keep in mind that dot .filter is going to create a brand new list. Dot .map is going to create a brand new list. So it's actually, you know, the lists themselves, when you do a filter here, it's actually creating a list of buckets and having those buckets point to the same elements as the first list. So in this particular case, the filter uh, it's it's going to create a, a list of length three that points to just those three elements there. The map is going to create a list of three elements pointing to the new values that came in there. Um, however, if you want to help get away from some of that, one of the things you can also do, again, is say as sequence. And what as sequence does is sets this thing up so that it will pass elements in one at a time as it's trying to do something. So in this particular case that I've written here, it's not going to need to create new lists. By saying it's an as sequence, it creates a new sequence object that wraps the list and interprets each of these following steps as actions upon elements in the list. So the first element A comes through, the filter lets it through, the map changes it, and then it sends it to the for each. The next one, the B, the filter accepts it, map change it for each prints it. The next one, the C comes through and so on. The next one, the triple C comes in, the filter says, nope. And then it stops there. It doesn't actually continue that chain. Jumps up to the next one, the, the DDC, the filter stops it. It doesn't go any farther than that. Um, depending on what you want to do, if you're not needing to create a brand new list at the end and hold on to that brand new list, the as sequence is your friend here. It's actually going to make things a little bit more fast, uh, a little faster, a little more efficient, a little more memory efficient. Um, he still is going to create a new object to help that out. So this here is going to be a little bit less efficient than doing this thing here, if that makes sense. So I'm creating the list and directly operating on that list. Now, of course, in this case, list, dot indices is creating a new range object. So there's an object there. We could actually make this more efficient by, um, well, let's see, can we do, I don't think there's, actually, I don't think there's a for, a for syntax that um, mimics Java's for syntax. Let me check real quick. Uh, let's see, Kotlin for statement. Conditions is loop. Uh, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum. When for yeah, there's no there's no other syntax for the for other than in some range. Um, so yeah, it's going to be a little bit less efficient, but at this level, we're talking about stuff that is is going to be pretty pretty. Uh, um, minimal as far as extra hits. Um, this one doing it with the sequence actually makes this one a decent bit more efficient, especially if you had a long list. Um, one other thing you want to consider, frequent use of recursion encouraged. Um, trying to describe your problems in terms of recursion 
uh, you're going to see a lot of functions defined in a recursive manner when you're doing stuff in Kotlin, when you're doing stuff in other functional languages. Um, one of the things you want to try to do, try to make tail recursive where possible. And this can be really critical if you have big chunks of data that you're walking through or your, your call stack's gonna get really super deep. Um, tail recursion can be handled by the compiler to be churned into just a loop. So instead of having a very explicit loop to walk through things, it looks like you have a function calling a function calling a function. So it has a very functional feel to it, but the tail recursion optimizes it behind the scenes. Um, that's called recursion optimization or tail recursion optimization. Um, Depending on your problem, I mean, not everything can be represented by a recursive algorithm, but if something can be represented by a recursive algorithm, it's strongly encouraged that you do so. Okay, any other questions before we move on? Okay, let's open up a new file here. So what I'd like to think about is how can we make a problem, uh, break a problem down and use parallelization to make things more efficient. So as a little example, let's start with a val list one equals list of, uh, let's say, yeah, maybe 10. So we'll have a list of 10 numbers there. And what we'd like to do is break, is map this, uh, each of these numbers to some new value. And let's say that that mapping actually was really expensive. So maybe, you know, for this example, I'm just gonna multiply it by two, uh, but uh, let's say that it actually was something more complex. Like maybe we have to go over a network connection and pull some data down, do something with that data to figure out, you know, maybe these are web page uh, URLs or something like that. We're gonna go look up the data and collect their data that's returned. Um, <clears throat> so what I'm gonna do to start with here um, I've included in here the coroutines library. So I'm able to use coroutines here. Let me update him. And so what I'm going to do is I'm going to use a run blocking just so that I can call the some blocking functions inside. Um, I'm doing it here just so I have consistency with the when I break this down into actual coroutine calls. Um, I want the code to look exactly the same in this block. Um, we're just going to call a different function. So inside here, let's do a println. And let's do a measure time millis, which will determine how much time this block takes. So at the beginning of that block, he's going to capture the current time. At the end of the block, he's going to capture the current time and report the difference between that. Um, so that's kind of a nice little useful function if you want to you know, try to time something. Um, you generally don't want that in your actual production code. It's really useful when you're testing out things just to try to see uh, how things are performing. And then let's print out a mapped list. So I'm going to say list1.map. And let's put in a delay here to kind of simulate a network call. So it'll make it feel more expensive. And then I'm going to say it times two. So that's just going to represent the data that we actually retrieved. Um, so what we should see here when we run this is the um, th the list of two, four, six, eight, ten, and so on printed out uh, with the time printed out after it. Uh, so by the only reason again I'm doing the run blocking is to have this delay call. The delay call you can see here is a suspend function, which has to be called inside of a coroutine scope. So the run blocking creates that coroutine scope for us, and then uh, it, it actually executes the delay. Um, I could have put a thread.sleep, it would do the same thing and I wouldn't need the coroutine. But again, I wanted this code that's here to be exactly the same that we're gonna see a little bit later with the exception of this map call. So let's see what this looks like. Do, 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 do. Okay, so he's still running and there we go. So yeah, I would have to use a second. Let me change it to 500. <laughs> so the next run will be a little faster, but you can see here it took 10 seconds, one second for each of those iterations through that mapping. So if we could break it down and actually have those, uh, those calls be executed in parallel, 
that would help us out quite a bit here. So if I did something like a, um, let's see, run blocking dispatchers dot default. So he's gonna be able to, in this coroutine, the dispatcher he's gonna use for this is the default dispatcher. So then anytime I launch something inside of it, it's going to pull something from the default thread pool. So different threads can come out of there. I think that's actually the default when I call run blocking without, um, what's his empty coroutine context. Uh, so by doing this, this is actually gonna split them up onto multiple threads in using this dispatcher's thread pool. So inside here, what I'm gonna wanna do is this exact same code. And I'm gonna change this mapping function so that every time I'm doing this mapping, I'm gonna kick it off on a different coroutine. But one thing that I wanna be careful of here is make sure that this mapping call that I'm gonna have, we're gonna call it pmap, is gonna be atomic. If any of those subcalls fail, I want this PMAP's coroutine scope to cancel all the others. And I don't want it to stop the outer coroutine scope. So if there's any other coroutines launched, I don't want it to kill anything. So when I define this PMAP function, I want it to create a brand new coroutine scope, which will track all of the child coroutines that are launched. We're gonna take a look at this PMAP function. And I actually got this from this website here. There's a little blog entry that describes what we're gonna talk about here very nicely. And so let's talk about what this uh, function actually does. So I'm defining PMAP and what I'm doing is this is a suspend function. So it can only be run inside of a coroutine. And uh, it means that anytime this function is called, the contents of this function can call other suspend functions. The, they can also launch coroutines. And anytime this function is called, the uh, coroutine runtime will allow another coroutine to take over that thread. So it'll, it may suspend this function to share. It's basically that yield call that happens automatically. So this function is gonna have two type parameters, A and B. And these are gonna represent the data from the incoming list and the, the, the type of the data in the incoming list, the type of the data in the outgoing list. Those are gonna be used in the mapping function that we use, which is gonna look like A to B. Input is A, output is B. Note that this mapping function is a suspend function. So that means inside of that block that we use, we could actually call suspend functions. So note down here inside this PMAP, I'm calling a suspend function in here, delay. So that should work just fine. Um, and let's see, we're gonna call it PMAP. He acts as an extension function on anything that's iterable. Now remember, list is iterable. Iterable just says, I have an iterator function. The iterator function will return an iterator. That's somebody who's a tour guide that will help us walk through a data structure. This is the iterator pattern is one of the gang of four design patterns, by the way. And it's just defined as having, if we take a look at the iterator function, a next function and a has next. So anything that has next and has next can be used as an iterator. And you can use that in a loop by saying while has next, get the next one, do something with it. While has next, get the next one, do something with it, and so on. So it's a nice simple abstraction to allow you to have any type of data structure you define be operated on by the same kinds of loops who just wanna walk through the data. Okay, so any type of iterable thing we can call PMAP on. Um, what this guy is gonna do is he's gonna use the suspend function to create a brand new list of the output type B. To start with, we're gonna create a brand new coroutine scope. And this coroutine scope builder here just allows us to create a new scope for the strict purpose of managing the child uh, coroutines that are created. Anytime one of the child coroutine dies, it's gonna kill all of the child coroutines underneath it. So if there's an exception thrown, this guy ends up killing everybody underneath without affecting the ones up at top. When the exception will get propagated, 
but this but it won't automatically cancel. It depends on what the the parent coroutine is doing. Um, so this is this is uh, giving us what we call structured concurrency. We're structuring this function, so using this coroutine scope to manage the new coroutines that we create here with the async call. So create that new scope. Inside there, we're going to map this iterable into a list of deferreds. So calling async that starts a coroutine and returns something of type deferred. What that's going to let us do is wait for it. The each of those deferred has an await function. So I could do a dot await, something like that. And obviously this isn't going to work uh, the way I've written it right now. But when you async, you can wait for that deferred to finish. What we're doing instead is we're saying create a list of deferreds and then call await all on that list, which creates a special object that waits for all of the deferreds in the list to be finished. So this structure here, create and kick off coroutines, get the deferreds, and then we're just going to wait till they're all done. This breaks up the, the work, letting it be parallelized. So now that we have this pmap function, we can call it. So we'll come list1.pmap down here. Same exact code that we had inside here, measuring the time, doing all that type of thing. Let's see what happens when we run these. So the first one we'll see took five seconds. Second one took a little over 500 milliseconds. Um, each of the each of those individual steps had a delay of 500 milliseconds in it. Obviously, there's a lot of them being run at the same time here. If we can actually get the uh, the time down to just a little bit more than what one of them the iterations took, um, so this is kind of an example of how you can set that up to be able to take advantage of of parallelizing your application. Let's see, which is something else I want to talk about on this one. Any questions on that? So this is really, really useful. And um, if you build pure functions, so you know if the, the code that you're calling inside here keeps things immutable, doesn't have side effects, and you know, and make sure that the same inputs always produce the same output, that makes this possible. If, however, we had put code inside of here that had side effects. We could be in some big trouble here because we're breaking this up and running these pieces in parallel. And if they took different amounts of time, it may not be, uh, you know, in this case, we're going to get lucky on what order things actually get executed. But if things took different, uh, different amounts of time, we could get different results each time we run through this. And that can be extremely dangerous. So with parallelization, parallelization, wow, my mouth is totally working today. Uh, it allows us to uh, break our program down and works really well if we have pure functions. If we didn't have pure functions, we're going to have to add all sorts of thread safety mechanisms into this. And in some cases, it may not even be possible, depending on what you're trying to do. Um, and you could get vastly different results based on each run. So be very careful. Um, but this is an example of a function that can be created to parallelize things. Now, the Kotlin team is working on some extensions on top of flows and on top of uh, um, uh, uh, channels in order to be able to have parallelization be more standard in the language. Um, right now, you're going to see functions like this written by people saying, hey, I recommend you do this for parallelizing. Um, they're trying to make it so that uh, you, know, you can just say on a flow, make it parallel, go and do things. Java has that support in its streams. They're trying to do that in uh, Kotlin right now. Okay, so let's see. I think that was about all I wanted to, to talk about. Let me just check something here real quick. Um, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum, ba -dum.
No, actually, I'm not going to talk about that. Um, any any other questions on that? Um, so the, the main things that we want to get out of this, as far as functional programming, um, the big guys are these two guys up here. Um, you want to try to str try to do immutability as much as possible. So most of the time, prefer val over over var. Um, if you don't absolutely have to be able to modify something, don't. Um, second, prefer pure functions. Try to make your lower level functions be pure. It makes it much, much easier to test them. Let's see if I can actually show you a little example of testing here. Um, they do not have a test thing in there. Um, I thought there was something that would create a test skeleton. Whoops. Let's make that a Kotlin file. New Kotlin class file. Now, tests are one of these things that I set up once and then forget about them um, and then go ahead and add to them. So I'm going to take a look at a little Kotlin te uh, JUnit test example just to grab that. And we find a there's a simple little class there. So here's an example of a oops, does not have testing set up in it. It does not. Okay, I'm gonna hold off on talking about this until the break and I'll just set this up. I've just got to add some more dependencies here for testing and I don't wanna take the time right now to set that up. Make a little note here. Just, I just found my post-it notes and now they all disappeared. Set up J unit. That might be why it, it wasn't giving me that option. So I will do that in the break. And we'll come back to that and I'll show you how we can actually run a couple tests on these. Um, so let me kill him for the moment. Okay, any questions on uh, functional programming stuff before uh, I move on from here? I'm doing pretty good on time too. Yay. Okay, so close those guys down come into here and what I'd like to talk about is domain specific languages and I'm going to say here we're going to talk about internal domain specific languages um, the main idea behind the domain specific languages um, otherwise known as DSLs uh, is giving you a way to specify configuration of things or specify data uh, usually data, I mean, it could be execution, in a little language. And the reason we want to do this is a couple reasons. For one, if the language you're using requires a lot of boilerplate, specifying another language to automatically generate code, for example, to you know avoid all that boilerplate can make things so much simpler for you to deal with. You can also have domain, domain experts, so somebody who uh, may know a domain but isn't doesn't know your programming language, you can define a little language to kind of help them specify things. So for example, you might have a little language that says when, uh, oh, it might be an example here, when a passenger has the same passport number as someone on the no-fly list, uh, deny boarding, something like that. So you might have like a set of rules that somebody can type in in a much more Englishy way. Um, and if you define a, a language processor that can read this and pick pieces out of this to figure out what the user is meaning, 
and you usually have a, a, a pretty restricted dialogue or restricted uh, dialect. Um, this can be a lot more, uh, um, a lot easier for a domain expert, so somebody who is working with the FAA to decide who's going to be able to board planes. Um, that little language can actually help them write this directly without having to go down to the level of Kotlin to do their coding. Um, and that could be quite a bit nicer. Um, and depending on how you do your languages, you might have an external DSL or an internal DSL. And I'm just going to say it's a separate text file for an external DSL, um, not compiled by the normal language compiler. I'm going to say custom processing. And then you have an internal DSL, which is using nifty language constructs. inside a language. Uh, inside a normal compiled language. Um, the external DSLs, um, do I have one that's something that's handy? Actually, I do. Let me show you an example of a DSL that I wrote. I can remember where I put it. Uh, actually, I'll just open up Eclipse. I know I have it in there. So let me, what I've got in, in this Eclipse workspace, these projects here are my domain specific language processor. So I've actually written a program here that defines a grammar. So I'm defining a little language here. My little language has a bunch of pieces to it. My little language says that I define a course by having all these fields. And the course can reference, um, where's that good thing? Like it can have a list of assignments, it can have a list of modules, and then a module is defined as module name, some description, some information inside there, what it depends on and so on. And then all this describes a language that I use to generate my course content. So on the website, when you go to that, um, the course content section, that's the output of my little domain specific language processor. So this guy here is the code defining that processor. And then when I run the nested copy of Eclipse, it loads these in as plugins into Eclipse so that I can edit that description. So let me show you what the description actually looks like when this starts up. So here's a definition of this course. So this is the Object Oriented and Functional Programming in Kotlin. So I'm describing these things in a manner that is, is much more texty. So you can see I have a description, which is just some text here. And each of these text blocks might use Markdown. So right here, I've got, you know, here's all the, the stuff I'm defining all these sections in Markdown with uh, headers and bullets and things like that. Um, and then I also have the different modules. Now, in this this one isn't terribly interesting. Let me show you the one from my. Uh, actually, that's this one. I want to do this one here. So this is the one for my Android class, and the modules are a little bit more interesting here. So I say module recycler view module with the text on it. He depends on toolbars. I have an overview, and then I have objectives, and all of these are used to generate. Uh, the uh, the course website. And I use things like depends on to make sure that the order in which I define them here and the order in which I'm going to present them based on the weeks listed at the bottom are consistent. And that's helped me immeasurably over just trying to edit things on uh, Blackboard. Because if I reorder modules, trying to keep in my head which modules depend on which modules is really tough. And, you, and then I might present topics in an order that's really bad for the, the students. 
you know, they start watching a video and it's assuming that they've watched another video before that. And I may have screwed up the order. This doesn't let me screw the order up that way. Um, it also lets me define assignments. And then the assignments say which modules they depend on. And then I can go through this custom views guy here and transitively figure out his dependencies and list them to say which uh, uh, modules depend on, uh, or which modules are needed for this assignment. Um, so this thing does a lot of work for me, not only in generating all this HTML, uh, in tracking dependencies, generating the overview page and things like that. Um, it makes my life significantly easier. So this is one that I use, and this is actually an external DSL. You can see it has like course BB. It's not a Java file, it's not a Kotlin file. Um, this is just a text language that I came up with to help make my life easier. Um, I could have done the same thing in a language like Kotlin. Java doesn't really have good support to be able to write internal DSLs inside of it. Um, I've been considering converting this into Kotlin so I can just use the templating support inside Kotlin. The raw string stuff in Kotlin is fantastic for doing templates. Um, I just haven't gotten to that point yet. So that's an example of that. And then just to show you inside the generator section here, the templates that I define in this little language look kind of like this. So I have like for a common menu, here's the template. You can do something very similar to this in Kotlin using its raw strings. So it, 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 Kotlin uses uh, three double quotes. This little language here called extend uses three single quotes to define a template. Um, and then, you know, whenever you reference pieces of data, like, you know, in a little if statement here, if uh, not course outline only, um, you can actually build up a template very easily inside Kotlin. So an external DSL requires quite a bit of support to create. You have to create a processor. You usually have to define a grammar, like that first thing that I showed you inside there. Um, the thing that can be nice about it is it can be a lot friendlier to someone who's a non-programmer because then with an internal DSL, obviously you're hosting it in a real compiled language. So even if it's a simplified section of that compiled language, you still have them having to compile it using the normal compile process. Um, so this is typically makes a programmer life easier. Whereas this one can also make a domain expert life easier. So, you know, maybe you define a little language that uh, represents math a little better than you could in something like Kotlin uh, and in a way that is just more natural for them to express. Or maybe you're working with chemists and you want to have them have a way to represent uh, different types of chemical compounds. You could do that in an external DSL very nicely as opposed to having to come up with some way to represent it in objects. Because um, you can imagine someone you know, saying, create a new molecule and this molecule has these atoms inside of it and these number of these atoms and here are the bonds between them. Uh, that would be a real mess. But if you could come up with a little language that looks similar to the way that they might represent things, could even be a graphical language. You, you know, maybe it's a graphical editor where they drag things on the screen and then behind the scenes it generates the code. That can actually be quite a boon for them, and make their life so much simpler rather than having to write programs. Okay, so we are gonna focus on internal. DSLs. Um, so let's see, something like that. So let's see, let me get my little example up over here on my side screen. What I wanna start with is let's, let's start with some ways that we know to, to create instances of objects already. So I'm gonna create a class person and I'm gonna have this guy have inside of him a var name And we're gonna give him a default so somebody can either create the person using a constructor or not using a constructor. Age, address, and friend. So we'll do something kind of like that. 
So this is a little person class that is going to um, uh, allow us to either define things at construction time or define things um, afterwards. So let's say that we were doing something really brute force and imperative here. So I'm gonna say val person one equals person. So we're gonna create the person. And then we're gonna say person one dot name equals Scott. age, address. And then let's say that we want to create a friend. Well, we have to create that friend instant first. Something kind of like that. So this might be how, before we started doing fancy things with constructors and all that, this might be how you would have defined things pretty raw. And that's a lot of work. And it's there's a lot of um, kind of piecing together references where every time we look at this, we have to make sure we're actually using the right one there. This guy here has to be defined up here. And you know, if you forget to do this piece, you're kind of hosed. Um, there's no way that we can have the code double check this stuff for us. Um, what we'd like to try to get to is a point where we can define things and it looks kind of like data and it'll do some validation for us. And that can make things much, much simpler for us. So let's, the, the second way that we would do it just kind of normally is with the constructor. And this gets a little bit better. So we can pass in here, Scott, and 54 and 123 sesame and then person and 62 and 111 main so we could do something kind of like this and that's a little bit better so it's we've, we've now taken advantage of the constructor to kind of help us make sure we have things in the right spot but if we printed this code out, we're not gonna see these little hints, name, age, address, and so on. So what might be a better way yet would be to take advantage of our named parameters. And then we can make things even a little bit more readable if we do, um, whoops, I forgot to say friend up here. If we take advantage of new lines and spacing and things like that, now we've got something that actually looks a little bit more readable. Um, and it's really showing the structure. Before when we were doing these other things, these other approaches here, this guy, just by glancing at it, you can't see a structure there. You just see a bunch of wads of instructions, you know, how to set up data. This one, we start to see some structure because you can kind of see that thing, there's stuff nested inside a constructor, but it's not super readable. This one gets a little better because now we have those named parameters. But this one gives you a lot better clue of what's going on structurally here. I can see that I have a person with another person nested inside it. It becomes a lot more obvious how things are, are laid out. So the first step we want to do is take advantage of uh, spacing and new lines to be able to describe something and make it much more readable how things are actually working here. <clears throat> now things can get a little bit simpler and you know, we can also do things by using the apply uh, scoping function so if i said um let me just repeat this because it's not too different from that we'll make it person five so instead of actually using the constructor i can say dot apply and then i can get rid of these commas because commas are pretty annoying
and we have our code kind of look like that now. That has some advantages to the constructor version and to in which um, we can actually execute other code inside of here. So there could be to fetch the name or something like that. Um, which you could do via a function, but sometimes it'd be, if you just wanted to do it only here, you could have a couple lines of code to say how we're actually fetching it. Um, so that's one of the advantages of the apply. You can have more code than inside the constructor, which you know at this point, you just have to have a value. The only way you can do that is to have a reference to something, whether it's a function or a literal or a uh, variable or, or val. Um, so, you know, this this is um, it, it's we're getting a little bit better on these structures here. Um, what we'd like to try to do is make this a little bit more bulletproof. Um, so the first thing that I would like to do is to try to set this up so that uh, you know, we have a little bit more control on how things are are arranged. Um, the first step. What I'd like to do is define a little helper function. And I'm going to say he takes a block of code. The block code is an extension function on a person object and doesn't return anything. So it's just going to do stuff. And this function is just going to be create a person and apply that block to the person. So pretty straightforward. So this actually collapses these guys for me. So we no longer have the person dot apply. So it kind of hides that apply syntax behind the screen. So now I can say, take the same thing. And we'll say person six equals person one. Now I'm only calling this person one because I'm going to have, surprisingly enough, a person two function a little bit later. So very, very similar, but we've kind of collapsed away that, that whole actual creation of the person object and got rid of that apply on there. Um, what's really nice about that is that we no longer have person listed out there as what object is being created. We're just saying logically, I'm using this person builder function to be able to do something for me. The actual type that's returned could be anything behind the scenes. We could be creating a person one, we could be creating a person two, we could be creating an actor or a teacher, whatever we wanted to. Um, so this can actually abstract away the real type of the person that's being created. You know, we do see it being passed in as the this here, but it can abstract it somewhat so that, you know, we're not locked into always creating the actual person. We could create some subclass. But there's a problem with this. If we take a look up here at person, and let's say that we had some functions inside there. So let me grab a couple functions. Actually, we'll just put a little function in here that says fun run println dollar name is running. As we've set this up right now, there is nothing to prevent us from saying, let's say right here, actually even right up here, this would be even worse, run. And at this point, we have not fully initialized that person. So calling run there could be disastrous. And in this case, we're gonna get a null. It's gonna say null is running. Let's go ahead and run this and see what happens. So we'll see that null is running based on where we had that. What we'd really like to have happen is make sure that you can't call that run. And by doing, the only way to do that is to make sure that the thing being passed in here isn't the person itself, but something that is only responsible for building a person. And that actually gives us a lot more support for being able to validate before the person itself is created. So what I'd like to do is create a function, I'm gonna call it person2, that's going to create a person builder instance, initialize it using the block that you've written here. And then after that initialization is completed, then I create the actual person object. And what's nice about that is that we would now have um, 
a, uh, a, a complete person that is going to be safe to use. And we can't call functions that would be bad to call time-wise. Um, there's also nothing preventing us from doing this. We can hit a field more than once when we're defining this. <clears throat> and let's think about this one more step here. Take a look at person. He's mutable. So we don't we do not have an immutable person object being created out of this. Anybody can change it afterwards. So if immutability is something you want, this is a very bad way to go about this. The constructor version would work really well for immutability, but you you have a little bit more verbosity on it and you can't have any validation happening except inside the person. So if you want to have external functions do the validation and maybe have different types of validation on the same person. So maybe one builder would create a doctor, one might create a teacher, and maybe they have different kind of validation rules. Um, in this case, you wouldn't be able to, to affect that. You'd have to just have whatever the built-in validation inside person would be. So let's first of all take a look at how people do this in other languages. And you know, when without using the support in Kotlin for DSLs, how would we create uh, something to help us build an object? So let's have a class person builder old style. And the idea here is that the person builder is going to be a, a set of functions that are chained to create a bunch of data and hold a bunch of data and then finally build something. So there's going to be a build function that's going to return a person. I'm just going to say to do on there. So that'll make sure that blows up if I forget to implement it. Uh, and then we want to have functions to collect pieces of data. So the way this would work before, I'm just going to copy these fields into the builder down here. So we can kind of collect them along the way. I'm going to make them all private. Something like that. And then I'm going to define some functions to actually set these guys. Um, I'm also going to want to keep track of a, you know, actually, let me, um, what I want to do is have a name is set and then age is set and then address is set and then friend is set, whoops. So you can only define them once. And what I would do here is on each of these fields, I would define the setter and I would say, if name is set, throw a legal state exception, cannot set name twice and then say name is set is true and then field equals value something kind of like that and i would have this exact same type of code in all these other properties well we've already seen a way to help out there we can not have to repeat the same code over and over we can define a nice little um delegate for this guy i'm just going to copy the code in for him where did i define him So I am going to, oops. yeah, let's put it in here. So I'm going to define a delegate for this property. And this delegate has two fields inside of it, or two properties inside it, the actual value and whether or not it's been set. And then inside of here, Uh, I'm trying to see, oh, that's, it was a different, I, there was another thing that I did. It was in a different class I was thinking about. Um, so inside of here, when we set the value, we're going to do that same is set check, set is set, and then set the value. 
get value is just going to return the value. So we're going to use this to define those properties rather than having to repeat this over and over and over again. So each of these is going to be name by, uh, what did I call this guy? Builder property delegate, string question mark with a default value of null. And then we can do the same kind of thing for address and age, except age is going to be int and a zero in there. And then we have friend Just like that. So this is a really good example of when a property delegate is very, very handy. Um, we've got some logic here that we want to do some validation on. Um, and this is really helpful. So we've got all those guys. And let's see, what was the other thing I wanted to do with this? Um, so our build is going to need to collect all these guys. So um, we need to have a, um, a way of somebody setting these values. So typically with this old style builder, you would say I have a set name, which tapes a name string. And that's going to say this dot name equals name. And eh, I don't like doing this, but just to make this example work. Because normally what I would do is use the getters and setters that come with things. Um, but in order for this syntax to work, I can't, I have to have functions here. So I'm just going to rename these guys to have underscores in front, which personally I despise. Um, I don't like having markers to tell me if something is a, uh, a field versus something else. Um, it it, it kind of grosses me out. Um, but for this example, this works well because then I can actually do these age, 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 int, and it's string, and this is going to be person, person, friend, friend. And this one's going to be address, address. Wow, this is tedious. This is why I love Kotlin, because I don't have to do this anymore. OK, so here we have these set functions. But there's a little wrinkle that we like to do on a builder here. Each of these setters is going to return this person builder old style which will allow us to chain the calls together. So on each of these, I'm going to say, return this, just like that. And then finally, they can call the build, which will actually create the person. So let's see what that's going to look like return person, and we're going to pass in the name, age, address, and friend. But we'd like to double check that the right stuff has been set. Name, age, and address should be required. If you haven't specified it, that should be an error. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to say, if, I don't want to do it this way, I don't want to do it the other way yet. Um, let's actually uh, do it a little bit nicer way here. I'm going to add in a private val required fields equals mutable set of name, age, and address. And then inside here, I can say required, whoops, I need to make this be an inner class so it has access. 
And then I can say required fields dot remove uh, property dot name. So every time we set a value, it's going to try to remove the name of that property from the name, age, and address list there. Once it's, you know, if this set is empty at the end, we know we've got all of our required fields. So I'm going to come down here and say if required fields is not empty. And note that uh, there are functions like is not empty and things like that. The nice thing about this is that you don't have to, to put the not symbol in there all the time. I think it actually makes things a little bit more readable. Um, so then we'll throw legal state exception. Cannot create person following fields were not defined. And then we can say required fields, just like that. And so then that will create the person if everything else is okay. Note that friend might be null, that's perfectly fine. So now I can use this inside my code by saying val person seven equals person builder old style, whoop, and then set the things, set name, Scott, set age, 54, set address, one, two, three, sesame. And then dot build and poof, we now have a person that's been built and we have a person that's been validated. But the style of this is just kind of gross. You have all these chained function calls. Um, and you know, it's, it's, you know, it works, but it was a bit work to get to this point. We can do it a little bit easier and we can um, make it look more like this, but still have that same validation and everything in there. And that's what we're gonna talk about after our break. So it's 6.08 right now, let's say 6.18, we're gonna start back up again.
Hello, Professor. Hello. Did somebody just say something? Yeah, uh, I think you were muted. Yeah, I actually wasn't talking yet. I, I'm sorry, I was just typing some stuff in. Uh, sorry for the confusion there. I'll start okay. talking now. So anyway, um, yeah, and I had my uh, little chat window kind of shifted off to the side while I was copying some stuff over. But I think I got everything that I need right now. So let's talk about, I'm glad I was able to hear that from the microphone that was sitting down on the desk. Um, so let's talk about what I just did here. So for testing, you need to add in a few dependencies here. And honestly, I'm not sure what the Jupyter API is. I've got to look at that, but uh, I just copied that from the, uh, the test site there and uh, from the, the testing document. Let me actually just bring this over here. Um, so I went to this section of the cottonlang.org docs called test code using JUnit and JVM. And I just was copying a little pieces here, setting some stuff up in the build uh, build.gradle. And then I was just starting to write a little test here. So what we're going to do is I'm just going to test this little change name uh, function here just to see what uh, you know if it actually is returning something that I uh, expect it to. So I'm going to start off by saying val person equals person. Just, you know, with some data coming in there. And then I'm going to call change name, passing that person in. <clears throat> and I'm going to say, whoops. Oh, different API I'm used to. Um, so I'm going to say assert equals the expected value and the actual value. So the expected value here, what did I change it to, scooter? Yeah, is going to be scooter. And then the actual value is new person name. And we're going to see if that actually comes up with what we expect there. Now, one thing I'm going to note here, when I named this function up here, notice the back quotes. In Kotlin, you can actually escape uh, uh, any type of identifier you want. And you could have spaces in it if you want to. Um, I've only found this to be useful for test code. Uh, so when you actually have test functions, <clears throat> Otherwise, when you call things, you're going to have to type this in. But the nice thing about having the space is it makes the uh, the test report a little bit easier to read. So in this case, you know, we might want to call it test change name. You could have um, name is correct, you know, something like that. You can make it whatever you wanted to. Um, the other use for this is if you want to use a reserved word like val as a variable name. So you could do something evil like this. which is really, really gross. I, I strongly recommend you don't do that. Um, you're going to see this happen in generated code once in a while. So sometimes um, uh, sometimes you'll run uh, some kind of a, a code generator for a database or something. And if something happens to conflict with a reserved word in Kotlin, it'll escape it like this. Um, or if you're converting Java code to Kotlin, that's one of the more, more common ones. If I started off with Let's say I had a Java class, I'll call it foo. And then inside here, I had private string val equals AAA. And oops, semicolon. <clears throat> and then let's say I wanted to convert this to Kotlin, which I use alt control shift K, and it'll convert it. We'll notice that it actually puts that single quotes in there. This is the place you're probably gonna see it happen the most is if you convert Java code to Kotlin code. Um, so you know things like this will happen. I recommend afterwards you rename them, um, and you know you can also use the right-click refactor rename, which is Alt Shift R, and then just type the new value, hit Enter, and poof, it'll work just fine. Because um, you having those double quotes, the back quotes in there really can be gross to look at, um, but it is a valid thing. <clears throat> so if you have a really strong need to override a reserved word in Kotlin, you can. I don't recommend you do it. The one place I do recommend, I'm gonna say, do not recommend escaping keywords. 
Actually, I should say reserved words. Um, but you can, you know, if there's some some strong need for it. Um, but I'll put a little note here. Let's say recommend using function names with spaces only for tests. Um, <clears throat> and we'll see that actually printed up in the test report in a little bit here. Um, it, it's, you know, I, th I think it makes things a little bit more readable than having really long names there. Hopefully that makes some sense, but let's try this out here and see if it works. So I'm gonna go ahead and uh, what I did to actually get this class is I went to the class I wanted to test. In this case, it's this file. And I right clicked and I said, generate and chose test. And it generated that test class for me. Um, for this foo guy here, let's say that I had a function t1 equals 42. So if I come in here and say generate, oh, generate test, it's creating this foo test class. I'm going to put it underneath my uh, source test Kotlin. You want your test code to go underneath source test as opposed to source main. And then this guy here, we annotate the actual test function with that test a uh, that test um, annotation. And then you have your test the T1 function. And then assert equals 42. And then I need an instance of foo in this case. foo.t1. And you can run either all the tests in that class by pushing this guy or just the individual tests, test functions by pushing this guy. I'm just going to go ahead and run all of them. And hopefully this will work. So we have little warnings here, but that's okay. Um, and wasn't they keep changing the way this view looks. Why is it underneath the run one? Let's see what it looks like if I actually fail it. Maybe that'll actually... Uh... Okay, there we go. So it's giving this, this little uh, structure here showing you which parts failed. So this function here failed and it's giving you report information here saying what the problem was. You'll see it says, you know, test the T1 function. That was the actual test. Here it says expected 41, but was 42. It shows the expected and actual. If there was a more complex diff that you wanted to see, like let's say it's a string and you couldn't really eyeball it to see the difference, you can click here and it actually opens up a diff editor. So you can take a look and it'll highlight the differences inside the strings. Um, so that's an example of how you run this. And I'm gonna change him back to 42, run him again. And now it just says test results, everything's fine. Yeah, that's, I, I'm not too keen on this format because it used to have it where it would exp, it would still list the tests that were run, even if they all passed. And I, I liked that just because you got to know, you know, in case you had been running just an, an explicit test at this level, um, you could actually see which ones you ran and then say, whoops, I ran the wrong ones. Here, it's not too obvious. Um, but we can do the same thing with this other test class here. I'll go ahead and run them at this level. and he comes up with test results are just fine. Um, this works really, really well if you have functions that are pure. Uh, you don't have to do as much test setup on it. Uh, you just have to set up some variables that you pass in if you need any data coming in, and you'll always get the, the same results back. And that's really what you want to make sure happens. Um, you can set up your, your build.gradle to run your tests automatically. And I think if we come down to terminal and just say gradle w test. This is something that's usually run through our continuous integration server. So we have a server that builds the projects and then actually executes everything. And 
So he compiled them. He's just saying that everything was fine. I'm going to change this just to make sure that that actually did what I thought it did. Ah, good, good. Um, so it's saying that this particular test failed. So that was actually working right. So it goes through and it finds all the unit tests and runs them. Now, when you're writing unit tests like this, the idea is that you're testing functions. You're, you're not necessarily going off and writing database to a server. You're trying to just test a specific function in isolation. Um, I'm not gonna be covering tests a lot in this class. This is about all I wanted to talk about. Um, but sometimes what you're gonna wanna do is, let's say that a function uses other functions as input. You might wanna pass in some, some dummy functions that capture some information for you. Um, they're usually called you know, mock objects or mock functions. And what that can let you do is uh, avoid super long call chains. Um, one of the things that uh, if you uh, use dependency injection, instead of uh, um, you know, fetching data and fetching things, you know, explicitly listing what you wanna call behind the scenes um, using a singleton pattern, um, dependency injection can help because then you can pass in some dummy objects on what you wanna talk to. Um, I'm throwing out some words here that may not mean anything, my hope is that if you start actually working on this and then suddenly you hear the word dependency injection, you'll be like, oh yeah, Scott mentioned something about that. Um, but I'm gonna hand wave quite a bit here because I just wanted to show that you know, with, uh, a, um, with a pure function, when you set up a test like this, you really don't have to worry about setting too much else up. All you're caring about is what's the input and what's the output. And in this particular function's case, the output completely ignores the input, which is kind of silly. Uh, but hey, that works. I mean, uh, this one, a, a better way to do this, if we had a, let's make this a data class. And maybe we have a val age passed in as well. We'll create an instance of him. And then what is this guy? Oh, new person's never used, that's fine. Um, and change name. Instead of just saying create a brand new person there, what I'll do is I'll say person dot copy name equals scooter. And copy is a function that's created by the data class explicitly. He has all the possible values. I don't know if we can see what he's gonna look like now. He's, he actually is gonna take all the values from the constructor as arguments and the defaults are the existing value. So if you don't specify a value, it just copies the existing value. So in this case, it's gonna copy the age value and just change the name. So what I should be able to do in my test now is not only test if the name is correct, but I should see that person.age is the same as the new person age, because it's actually creating a brand new person object copying the same age value over. If I run that, everything should be perfectly fine there. Test events were not received. No value passed for parameter age. <coughs> um, there is a, oh, up here, there he is. So we're gonna start off, let's put in the 54 there. Run that, and now he should be okay. There we go, test results are fine. And if I had a different age up here, I got really old, we still are fine because it's copying that age over. Okay, any questions on that? Just wanted to do a really quick introduction on testing. The more unit tests you can run, the better. Um, I really should have, at the beginning of the class, talked about this and then set up the assignments so that you could write unit tests. Um, either that or provide you some unit tests that you could use. Um, I think I'll probably try to think about that next time, but I was I was more interested in actually just hitting the ground running with the uh, the actual Kotlin coding. More of my enthusiasm for that. Um, tests are boring. What can I say? I mean, they're they're great because it you know helps you ensure that things are going to work. Um, but uh, uh, you know it, it's you know not fun code to write. I like to write fun code, but. Uh, Definitely write, write a lot of unit tests because that way you can catch stuff that you break along the way pretty easily. Um, any questions on that before I move on? Okay, so back to where we were. 
with our builder. So we had this old style builder that created code like this and it does some validation. So in this particular case, if I hadn't set the age and I tried to run this, oops, I ran the test again. Let's go up to this main. I'm gonna get an exception here saying, a legal state cannot create person. The following fields were not defined, name, age, and address. Oh, so what did I do? What did I do? Let me look at that builder here. Oh, the, the actual names of these properties have the underscores in them and I didn't put the underscores up here. So they never got removed from this list. Now we should be okay. And we'll see it just says age. Oops. So the following fields, age. So age is the only one there. So in a case like this, we might want to actually try to make this a little bit more readable by removing those underscores. And then inside here, we'll say remove property.name dot drop one. And what drop one does, it says, it's a, it, it just says, skip the first, in this case, letter. Um, you can use it on a list as well to create a new list minus the first element. Um, there's also a drop last, so you can drop the last elements as well. And so now if we look at this, it should be a little bit more readable. There we go, age. So it's just saying that's that's the fields that uh, that weren't defined there. So this is getting a little bit better. You know, the thing I don't like is it has a a very old feel to the API here. I would like it to look much more like this and still have that same validation potential and all that. So let's define a better builder. Let's have a class person builder. And this one is going to have some similar stuff in it. So I'm going to have this required fields in the same builder delegate. Bring them up there. And I'm going to make these guys be, well, they should have been vowels. Or no, they're vars. That's right, they're vars. And what did I do wrong on those? Oh, the actual type inside this uh, builder in here. There we go. So I'm gonna have those that data inside there. So it's gonna keep track of all those guys. Um, but I'm also gonna have a build function, which is going to return a person. And inside here, he's going to do that same kind of thing that we had. Drop him inside there. So this is going to get a little nicer because I didn't need to have those functions to actually set the data. I'm actually going to be saying name equals age equals address equals and things like that. So by doing this, I can return a person after I've validated him. Um, and the user can't call that run function because the person builder is the object they're gonna have instead. So let's define fun person two, who's gonna take a block that's gonna be based on a person builder. So it's gonna be an extension of person builder. And often in Kotlin, you're gonna see this listed as init. So when you see different examples for uh, builders like this, they usually call that function init. So we're gonna call this a, let's see, we're gonna say person builder, create him. I'm gonna do a run on him and we're gonna call init and then we're gonna call build. And what the run does is it passes in that person builder as the this, we're gonna call init on it, passing the person builder in. Then we're gonna call build to create that person and the result of the run is the person because the run takes in the receiver as this, and then returns the last expression. So that should build things up. So now I can do this same kind of block 
down here. And I'll say person two. And now you'll notice that the run can't be called. So now we can't accidentally execute things on it before it's ready. So he can no longer be called. And take a look at these ages. Let's see what's going to happen if I run this now. So we have age is already set is being called here. So it's telling us as of that line who's called from here, age equals 48. We've already set the age. So it's going to catch the doubles like that. And most of the time, you know, assigning something intentionally twice isn't really a problem. The problem that usually happens for this kind of duplication is that somebody did a copy paste and forgot to change it. So you'll notice earlier on, a lot of times I was repeating all the set name lines several times and then changing them. If I had forgotten to change one of them, I'm kind of hosed. So this is another thing that kind of helps catch extra copy pastes. Also in a case like this, maybe somebody wanted to change the value and maybe these lines weren't right next to each other. Maybe it was kind of like this. And so maybe they put this in and, or put this one in up here and forgot that they had one down here that actually you know, supersedes it. So that one will be caught. And let's say that we actually forgot to initialize something. So like address there, when I run this now, we'll see that cannot create person, following fields were not defined, name, name, name age, address. Oh, <laughs> I still have that uh, drop code in there. So in the new style one, I wanna get rid of that drop. And then we should be good. It should just say that address isn't defined now. Yeah, there we go, we got our address there. Um, so, so far we've gotten a lot of benefit by using this builder here to collect the data and then build all at once, doing any validation that we need and then making sure it sends things through. So pretty nifty so far. Um, let's take it a step further. Let's say that our person not only had these types of fields, let's say that he had some um, uh, callbacks that we might have inside here. So maybe we have a uh, var, well, first of all, I'd like to change those to vals. Oh, the, see the other thing here is that not using, actually, let, I should make a person two, let me do that. I'm gonna make a person two that now has these all be vals. And they're no longer nullable up there. The friend is still going to be nullable. Um, and down here in my person builder, I'm going to rename him to be person two builder. So this guy here, he's now taking these in as inputs from person two. But we have a little bit of an issue here. <clears throat> Notice how it's complaining because the stuff we're passing in are nullable fields. So name is a nullable name that starts at null. Well, let's think about this for a second. This check here is making sure that we've set it. If we make this guy be non-nullable, that means somebody can't explicitly set it to null. And this check is gonna make sure that it was set. So at this point, we should know for sure that it's not a null value. To do that, we change these guys to be not nullable and then give them a default value. And that default value is guaranteed to not be there. I mean, they're gonna have to set something. You know, maybe they set it to blank. Maybe we wanna actually inside here also check to see was it non-blank or up in here, make sure it was non-blank as well. We could add that check as well. Um, but this now allows me to have these fields here be non-nullable. Let's see what he's complaining about now. So, oh, um, friend has to be a person too. And he has to return a person too. And so friend is a person too. Oh, I didn't change him up here, did I? No. OK. 
Okay, and so let's see what's going on in here now. Um, friend is a person too, and there we go. So what we've done now is set this up so that person is immutable, which is really a bonus out of this. Um, in the other forms of this, with the right, with the the normal person up here like this, these guys here are mutable, and they have actually not that one. Um, this one here, these fields are all mutable, and they have to be mutable so we can set them. Otherwise, we wouldn't be able to set them. If we want to create an immutable person, our only choice with this one would be to define person to have just a constructor that we explicitly set. So we wouldn't be able to use this nicer syntax. So now with our person two call here, we're creating person two objects with these field and they're guaranteed to be set and be non-null. So now let's extend this person two to have some more stuff inside of it. So I'm gonna say he's gonna have a, uh, let's see what I wanna call it, a val, on step taken. And we'll just say that he's going to be a function that takes a, uh, it takes no arguments and doesn't return anything. <clears throat> and I'm going to make this be nullable so that it's possible for some to, to not specify uh, that they want to call back for steps being taken. So let's see. Let's, let's do one other one as well. Let's say a val on. Uh, awake changed. And we'll say that this one's going to be Boolean unit. So he's going to take a Boolean representing if the user's awake or not. So anytime the person wakes up or falls asleep, this one would get changed. And I'm not going to call him, but that would be like an example of what that does. And let's say that every call to run, oh, my girlfriend's making some food and it smells so good. Um, how long does this class go? Anyway, um, so let's say that every time we run, we're going to take 10 steps. So let's do a repeat 10 times on awake changed let, because it's going to be nullable, call it. And Oh, I'm sorry, not that, on step change. I was sort of like, why is it requiring an argument? There we go. On step taken, if we have an on step taken, call it. Now we can do this a couple different ways. Um, instead of using the let, I could say on step taken, question mark dot invoke. And that'll work as well. Um, this is really just a matter of which style you prefer. Um, I typically will call invoke. Um, it's one of those things that a lot of people don't know you can call invoke on a, uh, a Lambda. Um, if the Lambda were not nullable, you could still say the Lambda name dot invoke, but you'd really prefer to just say the Lambda name print print. Um, so either of these will work. I'm gonna go ahead and copy that out. This form or this more explicit form. Either one of those is perfectly fine. Um, it's, you know, it feels a little weird to me to have something in between the actual lambda name and the parens, but once you're used to this form, that works okay. This one just lets you say, if it's not null, call it, otherwise ignore it. <clears throat> and this actually, it, it might be better to write this whole thing as more like this. Oops. We'll just do it like that. So if I do it like this, this is actually a little bit more efficient.
Um, it's a little bit more efficient because we're only doing that null check once and then only executing that repeat if we actually have something to call. So um, <clears throat> if there was more to do inside there other than just the calling back, uh, then you know either way would be fine. But uh, in this particular case, this might be a little more efficient because we only enter the block if there is something to call. Okay, what is it complaining about here? Maybe private, I guess. Yeah, um, this one we probably do want to make private. And we'll do the same thing here. Um, name, age, address, and friend, we probably still want to be public in case somebody wants to actually be able to get to them directly. Um, so let's see what we got down here now. So he's complaining now because we're not passing in those callbacks. So we need to set those up inside here as well. So I'm going to come back up to my person too. I'm going to grab these guys, go down to my builder, and we'll add those fields in. But these ones, I don't want them to say on step taken equals something. Um, I would like to have it look a lot more like a, um, a block definition for what these guys are. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to keep these being private. They're going to be vars. <coughs> And we'll say they're equal to null to start with. And I'm going to define a couple functions here. So I'm going to have a function called on step taken. And he's going to have a block, which is going to look exactly the same as that one. It's going to have a unit. And what he does is he's going to say if on step taken is not equal to null. And we could define a delegate for this as well. I don't want to bother right now. Then I will throw that. On step taken is already set. Otherwise, on step taken equals um, block, like that. And then we'll do the same kind of thing with on awake changed, except he's going to have a Boolean coming in there. Something like that. And then we can pass these guys in here. And we can define these now when we're actually creating our object. So when we have our person eight, I can come in here and say, on step taken with a block. So I'm not using that assignment syntax. I'm just actually defining what it means to take a step. Something kind of like that. And maybe I do or don't define the other one. You know, I can define it if I want, not define it if I don't need it. And so this gives us uh, some different tools to work with when building up this little domain specific language. Okay, questions so far? I will take that as a no. Um, at any point, by the way, if, if you have questions, feel free to just blur them on out. I mean, you guys haven't been shy about that, so that's been good. Um, so I'll just have to assume that I'm doing a perfect job describing everything because nobody has any questions. Um, so uh, we've now defined a nice little language here to define people. Um, what I'd like to do now is, is show you a couple other little DSLs that I created um, things that I demonstrated during the last session I did. I wanted to start off with a simple DSL this session, but I'm going to show a couple more complex ones now. Um, see if I can find which one it was. Week 12, that guy. So this is the week 12 from before. I can show you a couple different types of domain specific languages that uh, do a couple of interesting things here. So, um, this one I'm going to walk through kind of several steps. I'm going to go through kind of quickly, but feel free to break me at any point here. We've, we've got a little bit of time, but not a huge amount of time. So this one is for defining a state machine. And this is actually, um, uh, this is a state machine for a Rube Goldberg uh, game that I wrote a while ago, where you'd have like, in this case, uh, this is defining what the clapper does. So the clapper is a little electronic device when you clap, it turns the lights on, you clap again, it turns the lights off. 
Um, so this little state machine, we're defining a, a way to represent it. And kind of a brute force way would be have a map of transitions. So we have some events represented by enumerations, electric on, electric off, and clap. States, not powered, powered, and lights on. And then a map of saying, if I'm in not powered, then electric on goes to powered. If I'm in powered, electric off goes to not powered, clap goes to lights on. If I'm in lights on, electric off goes to not powered, clap goes to powered, and so on. And then there's some code inside here for handling an event that says, look up the set of transitions for the current state, try to get one for whatever this event is. And if we couldn't find one, stay in the current state. Otherwise, our current state is the new state from there. So that's just kind of walks you through a state change machine there. Let's take a look at the second one here. So this one is using a constructor-based approach for structuring things. So in this case, I've defined a state machine class, which is going to help us do things. And what the state machine does is he starts off by passing in a initial state. So I'm staying not, not powered. And then define states. So we get, a, we get a varying length list of states coming in. If we take a look at this definition, he has the current state coming in and then a varying length argument list of states that he can keep track of. Um, and those, whenever he wants to transition, he's going to walk through that list of states, finding a state where the state ID is the current state. So this is not a super efficient way to represent this because this could be a long list. Uh, but it's a fairly easy way to write the code for right now. Um, in, a, in a more realistic application, we probably want to take this list and create a map out of it. So instead of using a find here, which will walk the list checking each thing, we could just directly look things up. So we'll see that this form of it is a little nicer. Uh, we don't have the separate map out here. We now have these objects representing things. And then we can just call state machine handle event in here to actually test it out and do things. If we go to our next version of this, what is different about this guy? Notice how the code is getting so much shorter in a lot of these. Ah, so this one, this one here, we were using enumeration classes. This one, we're switching to sealed classes. And what's nice about this, if you take a look at this guy, when we're rep when we're using enumerations, we have to specify the enumeration name dot thing, enumeration name dot thing, and so on and so on. If we're using instead sealed classes, we just mention the name of the objects. So here I have a sealed class called event and I have three objects. There's only a single instance of these that exist. Single instance called electric on, electric off and clap and states, same type of thing. So this one just gets a little less wordy. Uh, and I, I like it this way, it's, you know, get our code shorter and a little cleaner to read and everything. So now we'll go to this guy here. And this guy is using that older builder pattern to build things up. So we create an instance of a state machine. And in this case, um, that, that's actually, he's, he's his own builder basically. And he has these functions that create things. So we have the initial state defined, a state. Once we have that state, we have these on uh, calls here, which basically say how to actually do the transitions and then build it. And this is looking even nicer because it's a little bit more compact, it's a little bit more readable than just having a bunch of objects passed into constructors. We still have the sealed class use up here. This version gets a little bit nicer. So this one, we're actually going to use a DSL. So I define this state machine function, which is going to take that, that uh, initializer, create a state machine builder. I'm using run here instead. Uh, or actually, no, I was using run before. Uh, call init and build and poof that'll return my state machine the state machine builder i created a little helper class called composite builder which just keeps track of children um, and uh, i just did that as a little abstraction so i could actually save a little bit of work in some of these but it doesn't save too much um, so what he does is he, when you're inside this composite builder he defines a function to find a state and what's really nice about this is instead of putting this at the top level where you could call it in the wrong spot, it's only callable once you've actually created a state machine builder. So the state the um, state machine function is top level, so we can call him. Where is he? Here. But these state calls can only be ha happen underneath state machine, which is really nice. 
Now this guy here, DSL marker, is useful if you create this little builder marker guy. So this is an annotation DSL marker. You create your own annotation and then put this on your builder classes. So we'll see here that all of my builders, composite builders and other builders, are annotated with this. It helps scope these different calls. So if I set inside here um, initial state, or if I tried to say initial state here, it won't let me. Um, if I didn't use that annotation like that, so if I came down here and got rid of him, then notice that this is perfectly fine. And this can lead to all sorts of errors because what I'm doing is I'm actually seeing outside of the scope of this state builder to the state machine builder and setting his fields. By using this annotation and putting on all of my builders, it stops me from doing that. So it only allows me to set up to, to call things that are based on the state builder at this level and not escape that builder, assuming this builder is actually marked with that annotation. So that's pretty useful. <coughs> Excuse me. So the other thing in this one, we then have our state machine and our um, state builder. So the state builder is kind of simple. He defines transitions, so you can't call transitions from other things, which calls our transition builder run init. And then he adds the children to that um, uh, to the actual object that's being built, the children of the state builder. Uh, so this guy has a fairly nice setup here. He, I'm not doing a lot of validation on him, um, but you'll see that the structure is a lot more readable at this point. But we can still improve things. So you go to this one here. And notice now the way that this thing reads. I have electric on goes to powered. Electric off goes to not powered. I no longer am creating these explicit transition objects here because that's kind of wordy and it actually takes up more space. But now what I'm doing is I've created this little function goes to, which is a infix extension function on events defined inside the state builder. So it's only available in the state builder. The receiver is an event. Then they say the word go to, and then the, net, the state as the uh, argument. It's infix so that when I use it, I have the receiver, the infix function name, and then the argument. This little enhancement can really help in some points in readability. Um, there's not, you, there's not, you can't do it with every spot inside here, and it definitely doesn't work if I if I try to define it on the state builder because I'd have to explicitly say this goes to, and that gets awkward because you have to have something syntactically on this side. But because I'm using objects here, I'm defining that extension function on this events class up here so that this becomes a function call. And then that makes things look a lot more readable. So now as we look at the state machine definition, it becomes a lot easier to read. Let's look at the next step here. <clears throat> so this one here, um, let's see. Um, I think I used the, uh, I had a trick for the name because the, the difference in here, oh, the state ID was the, actually the, the ID of the state. That's, that's this guy up here. So what I did is I set it up so that this state function is another one of these infix functions that works on states. So we'll see up here, we have the state names just listed here. And then we use the word transitions to actually define that state. So if we take a look at him, this guy is doing the state builder for me by taking that state's name and it's an infix function of the state's name and then that block. So not powered, the function name, and then the argument, which is the block. So this is even looking much more readable at this point. I and mean, it, it really starts to, to you know, reduce the amount of code you have to write to define something like this quite a bit. Um, 
And again, this, this one isn't necessarily helpful for a domain expert, but it as my job as a programmer, this is significantly less to write and maintain than some of the earlier ones that we saw inside there. Um, and it reads a lot more like English at this point. So we have, here's the initial state, start state machine, creates the state machine instead of this state machine guy here. So we just took the initial state, put him as the receiver for the function that we're using to create the state machine. So the final step in this one, just to make things even a little bit cleaner, um, I added on an extra little function here. There's actually two things I did in this function. Um, one down here, this handle event guy, instead of having these be functions that look like state machine handle event, I can do state machine handle electric on, handle electric off. So these look more like commands that you're typing as opposed to function calls. Um, but the more interesting thing was this and run. So if I wanted to do something like when we transition, we execute a random block of code, which is a very useful thing to have in a state machine. Um, I've added this little extension function. And now we have this like sentence, clap goes to lights on and runs this thing. Um, and run acts on a transition. Goes to is gonna create that transition. So he creates the transition, adding in the information. So this part here, clap goes to lights on is a function call that creates a transition. Once we have that transition, that becomes the receiver for and run. But you don't have to have that. You can just go ahead and say electric off goes to not powered and be fine with it. Um, so this gives you a little bit more capability in there chaining these things together by using these extension functions. Um, now, some of these extension functions, I didn't have to define as extensions. I could have defined them directly on the objects. But I explicitly decided to use extension functions here just for this highlighting because the extension functions get highlighted in yellow. If I used a normal function for these guys, they get highlighted in white and it doesn't stand out quite as nice. I like to have these guys stand out in this DSL. Your mileage may vary on that. You may prefer to just have it all be white, in which case you would define the goes to directly on the events class itself up here to define it. Um, the only problem with that is you'd really want to have it only apply during a transition uh, set up here, so during, or during the state builder. Um, that's another reason to use this extension function is that you can say this function is only available when we're in a state builder. So that's the, uh, the state machine example. And you can see that the code for setting it up ended up getting a little bulkier down here. Um, it's still not bad, but uh, it's a good bit more code than this guy here. We'll see that this example, I think that's the one that has the least code in it. Yeah, this, this one here is really the shortest example. Um, so we're trading off a little bit more readability. I mean, this is okay, but I like the readability in that last example. Unfortunately, you have to add some code to do it, but honestly, 100 lines of code and you're doing all this really isn't bad. Okay, any questions on that example? Okay, and the last example I'm gonna show you is a, a, a graphic user interface. So in this case, I'm gonna be creating a swing user interface here. And I'm describing the swing user interface here with nested uh, elements inside of it. Um, and you know, we could eventually extend this to actually have, did I have this one actually support that? No. Um, we could extend this to be able to have uh, um, uh, action handlers in this, but I don't think I'm doing the, No, I'm not, I'm not doing an add action listeners. Um, so that, that's an extension we could add to it. Um, but I must have been talking about companion objects when, at, at this point when I was doing the class last time. Um, so inside here, this, this looks like here's, I'm defining my uh, frame that creates a frame builder. Inside there, 
I had these direction builders and apparently I have this set up so that the frame is always gonna create a border layout. So then inside there, I have north, east, west, center, and south. Inside north, I have a button, west a button, east a button, center a button. Inside the south, I have a grid layout. So it's gonna create a panel with a grid layout inside of it. Inside that, I have a flow layout, which is going to have a, again, another panel with a flow layout attached to it. And that creates my user interface. Let me see if this will actually run. I don't know if this example is going to run, but we'll try it. Ah, it did. So here's what the user interface looks like. And we'll see that in the south, what I ended up doing was create a grid layout with, um, actually, I should have re reversed that. Yeah, I should have that guy there. Let's try that and see what happens. I think that'll work. Yeah, that's more what I wanted. So what's happening is the grid layout is giving us buttons that are the same size, um, whereas the flow layout was making it so they weren't the same size. So the flow layout is basically shoving those that grid over to the side. Um, I really should have some space in there, but I didn't put that in the, the grid layout definition. Um, but you can see that I added all those buttons to the different sections, created this thing at the bottom with the uh, um, flow layout aligned to the uh, right. Um, the code for this guy is fairly simple. So my frame, this pattern you'll see a lot for all of these little builder functions. So the frame function up here, it's going to follow that same pattern, create the build, you know, take in an argument that is initializer for the builder, create the builder. Um, well, in this case, I could call apply because the, we're not returning anything, but that really should be a run. Um, initialize it and then return whatever we're building. Um, I have my uh, DSL markers so that it doesn't have that scoping issue I talked about earlier. Um, I'm using this kind of general composite builder to keep track of children and have a couple little helpers for that, um, mainly so that you know this build function becomes a template method. I can walk through the children and call add child and add child can be abstract and overridden in each of the subclasses. So this is an example where we're using, using the template method with subclassing to override hooks as opposed to strategy to override hooks. Um, and this is actually a, a a proper place to do that because we're not trying to change it at runtime. We're trying to change the behavior based on which actual class is being used. Um, so this is for setting up just the general concept of a uh, composite. Um, we're you know adding the the uh, uh, builder to the children. So when you initialize something, we're creating him and then adding him to my list of children. Um, this is a uh, builder for a border layout. So if I have a border layout created, he has that north, south, east, west, and center. Um, and when you add a child, here's the definition of what that add means. In this case, I had to actually keep track of the position, north, south, east, west, or center, and the pair. My frame builder is creating a J frame. And then I'm adding in, uh, doing the pack, default close operation is exit unclosed and invisible. So you remember seeing that code earlier when I created a little J frame. Um, for a border layout, I'm just creating a J panel who I believe is going to default to a border layout. It seems like he is. For something that's not a border layout, um, you have to define the, uh, uh, the, the explicit uh, layout type you wanna use. This defines a grid layout. This, def this is just a enumeration of our different flow alignments. I could have used a, a sealed class for that. And let's see, flow layout builder, the directions again, could have used a sealed class. Um, a builder for what to do for each of those directions and what valid things are to do inside of it. You'll notice that sometimes you're gonna have the same calls in multiple places. Um, if you can actually extract that behavior somewhere, uh, if if the behavior is the same, you know, extract it into a superclass or extract it into a delegate, sometimes that'll help. Um, and apparently, I tried something here that either didn't work or this was a different way to do it. I'm not sure. I'd have to think about it a little too much. Um, and then how to build a button. His build is just going to say create a button. Um, so this becomes a fairly nice little domain-specific language 
for representing uh, a user interface um, for using Swing. Now, one other one, let's see. Did I have that up somewhere? Yes. Let's bring him up over here. So this is from TypeSafe Builders at thecotlandlang.org. Their example is defining an HTML document. So um, they might have something that looks like this. And you'll see inside here, it's defining a header that has a title, a body that has an H1 and a P, uh, a anchor that has some parameters, and so on and so on. Um, let's see what that plus is being used for here. I'm not too keen on uh, overriding that operator. So unary plus. Oh, so he's adding it as a child. Eh, that's kind of gross. I mean, I can see I can see them doing it because you'll see here that it says child, 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 and so on. Um, it just feels really gross to me. Um, in this case, it's it's one way to do this because the uh, you can use a unary operator, which you know you don't have to have that extension. So you know, like I was using in um, where's my examples over here in this one here where I was using the sealed class as a receiver for a function. They're just using a unary operator um, to, so that they don't have to say this does something with an argument. Um, they could have just as well defined this as a function and said this add, this is some. Um, so I see why they did this here. It just, it's one of these things that I don't think is obvious. When you're, when you're looking at this, uh, you look at that plus and it really is kind of a head scratcher. Like, why is that plus there? You have to go and look at the definition to see why. Um, but, you know, I, I can kind of see it. It's just kind of unfortunate they didn't have it consistent where you always have to say plus in front of every child. Because, um, yeah, this B will automatically add it, but it seems inconsistent with this plus here. So I'm not super keen on this definition. Um, Trying to think if there'd be a different way that I would do it um, and be able to, to still have the, uh, the functionality. I think really the thing is that instead of having this B function here, you'd basically have a T for text or something like that with this, this is some inside a curly brace and then that would take care of it. And then things would feel consistent. Um, they were just trying to, to get a little, um, yeah, I think I actually would have defined a function called text and then uh, just have that be an argument either in curly braces or in parentheses. Um, I think that would have read, read a little bit cleaner than what they're doing here. Um, so, but this is their example is using this and uh, these little languages can really help uh, reduce some code, give you that extra validation and um, you know, generate, you know, it doesn't have to necessarily be a one-to-one -one generation of things. It, you can actually generate quite a bit more objects uh, based on a really small little language. Any questions on that? So I used to teach a domain-specific language class here at uh, APL. I did that or at, at Hopkins. I did that for one term. We had four students show up. And then the next time we tried to run it, we only had three people sign up. So um, the problem is that, you know, when people see domain specific languages, they're like, what is that and why do I care? And, you know, no matter how I describe it in the catalog, people are always like, what is that and why do I care? Um, it's one of those things that I, I think is a really awesome topic. And there's so many things you can do with it to make your life as a programmer and a life of um, your domain experts much, much more flexible when you're coding. And if more people were aware of these, you could really take advantage of it. So, you know, I recommend, you know, playing around with these builders. Uh, you know, don't overdo it because it is possible to overdo these things, but um, it can actually help you in several ways. And, you know, there's several different language features that pull together to give you this functionality. Any other questions? Oh, I'm sorry, I went over, I didn't even notice. <clears throat> I thought I was going to end early, but now it's 718. Well, thanks for sticking with me. And uh, if you have any questions on the assignment or anything, you know, give me a yell. Um, otherwise, let's see, is, 
is, let me check the schedule here real quick. Um, course content. Do we have one more before or? That's this week. Oh, next week is the final exam. How about that? Um, wow, that snuck up on us really fast, didn't it? So um, anyone have questions on the final exam? I know it's, uh, you know, if, if you want to bow out, feel free. And I will, and I will uh, see you for the exam next week. Um, if you have other, other questions during the week that come up, feel free to ask. Um, at this point, anything in the course is up for grabs for the final. I believe I focused it on the stuff after the midterm. Um, I'd have to take a look at what I wrote last time because I'm going to tweak it for next week. Um, but uh, and I think the way I structured it, it's a little bit easier than the midterm. Uh, the main thing I think I changed was instead of having as many. I think I went with with fewer of the multiple answer ones because those those can be really tricky. It's just so easy to miss one here or there. Um, but I try to give partial credit on things like that. So. Yeah, wow, we're at the end of the term. That snuck up on me really fast. I'm sure it snuck up on you guys too. So anyway, um, if you have questions that you know you want to know before the, the final exam, let me know. It's similar format to the midterm. Um, same rules apply. I'm going to open it up at 4.30. And if anybody has any issues, give me a yell. You know, Sometimes something goes wrong on how I set it up, or sometimes Blackboard is just evil. Um, otherwise, um, have a great week. Good luck. And, uh, you know, I, I guess at this point, I should also say thank you for being with me for the term. Uh, it's been a pleasure teaching all of you. I hope that you've uh, learned quite a bit out of this. And I hope you end up using Kotlin for, uh, you know, different types of uh, places where you'd normally use Java uh, or for, you know, any other type of use. Um, so for those, anybody graduating, anybody who's graduating, um, congratulations. If you're not, you know, you're going to be one more step further toward your graduation. So have a great week, everybody. Thank you so much, Professor. Very welcome.